Hello, and welcome to Wesley United Methodist Church of Trenton, Missouri. Our church is located at 113 East 9th Street, which is on the corner of 9th and Washington in Trenton, Missouri. You can call our office between the hours of 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday at 660-359-6762, or visit our website at wesleyunitedmethodist.us. Now we invite you to open your heart, mind, and body to the Word of God with Rev. Barry Bulware. Our scripture this morning comes from Mark's Gospel. We're in the third chapter of Mark. No, we're in the second chapter. We're in the third chapter of Mark. (laughs) We're in either the second or the third chapter in Mark. (laughs) And I begin with verse 1. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal such a man on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill life? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. So he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. May God bless this reading of his holy written word. Please be seated. Here's the straight scoop on Jesus. He wasn't so much a religious man at all. In fact, he encountered most of his trouble from religious people. And it would be fair to say that he didn't encourage other people to be religious either. If we're going to look at Jesus as he really was, is, and always shall be, we'll need to understand just why he turned his back on religion and we'll need to understand what he turned his heart towards instead. There are actually only a handful of accounts of Jesus getting good and angry in the Gospels, which is surprising given how much provocation others provided him. In fact, the specific Greek word for angry is used only once to describe Jesus. And where did that happen? In today's text, where it reads, Jesus went back into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. And later on, it comes right out and says, he was deeply distressed by their stubborn hearts, and he looked around and saw them in anger. Anger. Your Savior, my Savior, anger. Jesus got good and angry inside the religious building here called the synagogue. What caused all of this fuss in the first place? Jesus ended up healing the man with a bad hand on a Sabbath day. Healing was considered work, and work was not to be done on the holy day. Keep the Sabbath holy. It's that simple. This is not a complicated case at all. The Pharisees saw what God had done, and they grew furious at Jesus. If you're going to heal this man, they were thinking amongst themselves, the Pharisees, wait until tomorrow, any day but the Sabbath, but don't do it on God's holy day. No doubt that's what they were thinking. Now that's the story in a nutshell. But really, that's the part of the story that is seen by those who were there. There's also the root of the story that is unseen Altogether. 
The root of the problem was a group of religious Pharisees who used their religion as a power of control over any and all people who were not as fortunate as they were. It's not so much that they wanted to humbly obey every law of God to the last period as it was that they envied Jesus' ability to heal someone regardless of what day of the week it might be. And the part of the story that really made Jesus upset the most, I think, was the fact that this misuse of religion happened inside God's house. This entire story is nothing short of religious nonsense. And the end result was twofold. It infuriated Jesus And it made the Pharisees so vengeful that here, right here, is where they first began making plans to murder Jesus. We are no further in the book of Mark than the third chapter and the first verse. And we have religious authorities who are already plotting and planning not to do Jesus in, but to murder him. If Jesus was characterized by anything, it would be his ability to clear away the fog and to see truth for what it really is. Here's a Jesus truth. Loving the culture of the church is not the same thing as loving Jesus himself. The Pharisees... They loved the trappings, the long prayers, the stylish robes, the bestowed honor placed upon them, the prestigious authority granted to them, but they did not love Jesus at all. In fact, they hated him because they were jealous of him. The culture of the church exists today. We see it in denominationalism every day. One denomination thinks of itself as having the single copyright of true doctrine, while other denominations are but facsimiles of lesser concerns. It's arrogance through and through. It's nothing less than when someone says, my church steeple is taller than your church steeple. Did you notice how Jesus did not permit himself to get into an argument with these Pharisees? He didn't. All he said to them was, what's best for the Sabbath? Helping people or leaving them helpless? And they didn't even try to answer his question. That's the thing about Jesus. He was able to clear away the fog and cut right to a truth. Just nail the truth. And in the meantime sometimes nailing those who were religiously fogged over. It's another good example of Jesus' disruptive honesty. Remember that sermon in this series? Where just a few words cut to the embarrassing core of a problem. The Pharisees held up the issue of Sabbath rules and regulations. Jesus emphasized healing, and wholeness. Loving the culture of religious trappings is not the same thing as loving Jesus. It never has been, and it never will be the same thing. Such a Jesus truth should remind us to follow his lead. Don't make small what should be big, and don't make big what should remain small. I'm going to speak right from my heart, 100%. Four years ago, in the middle of summer, I delivered a series of messages that taught me many things. Actually, you were quite easy on me. But I know I stirred some hearts and some heads. I brought in together a mixture of two things, spirituality and politics. 
Have you noticed that since then, four years ago, I have not done that? I was wrong to do it. Oh, I'll stand by the sermons. I still believe the Constitution of the United States is the most important document that America will ever have. And I think it's being misused. But it's not my place as a minister of the gospel to say that to you. That's your place to be an above-average citizen. I was in the wrong to deliver that series of messages. And it felt good delivering them. And then afterwards I thought, did I misuse my opportunity here? And I said to myself, yes, Barry, you did. You might have been right on target. Who knows? You might have spoken the truth that someone needed to hear. Who knows? But you brought politics into your church. I won't do that again. It's wrong. It's wrong for me to do it. It's wrong for anyone to do it. Now, having said that, let me point out that in the United Methodist Church today, on a national level, there are two types of people who are doing that and getting by with it. They are activists and they are political persuasionists. And the ones who do it the most, look, I know this sermon goes out on the air. This sermon will end up on on the website. I know that. I know who watches these sermons. The ones who are the chief activist and political persuasionist in the United Methodist Church more than anyone else are the bishops of our church and they think they can get by with it. And they misuse their positions of power. They're so caught up sometimes in their culture of the church and the authority that the church bestows upon them that they go beyond what they should do. And it's true. It's very true. We here in Missouri have had a bishop like that. We don't now. And when the bishops last united together and supported something on a political nature, three different churches that I have served called me and said, Barry, is that right? Can they do that? And I said, no, they can't. But you can't stop them. We should, but I don't know how to do it. You either, if you're going to put the robe on, are going to be a minister, or you take the robe off and you be a politician. But you cannot be both. Look how Jesus never got involved in politics. He could have cut down the Roman rule enormously. Did he do that? No. He could have aimed his target at the Jewish authorities. All he did was tell the truth about how they were misusing their power. He wasn't trying to destroy them as a part of the Judeo religion. We today have to make sure and be on guard that the activists in our churches are really activists for a part of the gospel and that that's what they're supporting and that's what they're trying to spread is the good news of Jesus Christ. And if that involves getting into some political things, then they can remain activists in the church. But if it doesn't involve spiritual things, get out! You're misusing the church for your own political agenda. If I can see that self in me, I can see it in others. And I can see it in others. And it is a misuse of the church. I told you I was going to speak from the heart. And I'll probably get in trouble for this. And if I do, it's because there's truth here. So don't forget, Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. The religious leaders decided to kill him. The culture of religion 
can be mighty nasty and slippery as an oyster. Jesus cleared away the fog that entrapped the Sadducees and the Pharisees in the culture of their religion. He did that back then, and he wants us to do the same thing today with our church. Sadly, there were those back then who weren't willing to give up the trappings of their religion for a relationship with Jesus. But the same thing can be said today. That's what we've said so far. So here's a second Jesus truth. Loving Jesus has no substitute. None. Why is there no substitute for our love of him? In his own words, at another place in the 14th chapter of John, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He is the way to God. He is the truth about God, and he is the truth about ourselves. And he offers us life, the kind of life that God has to give to us. I have often said in my ministry, this is one of those little Barry-isms, for whatever it's worth. (laughs) I have often said that Jesus was God's way of getting rid of, of a bad reputation. Look at the Pharisees in today's scripture. Would you be attracted to the way they practiced their religion if you saw that today? No, you would not. They were so caught up in their own self-righteousness that they missed God's original intention of the laws and the covenants God had given those laws and covenants to their ancestors, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and especially Moses. But these Pharisees used religion to benefit themselves, not God. And then Jesus came along. No one was able to stop him from loving the sinners. No one could keep him away from the cross for the wrong. That is in humanity. No one had ever loved God as purely, as sacrificially, as innocently as Jesus. He really was the way and the truth and the life. Our denomination has built over 125 colleges and universities. I've lost count how many hospitals the United Methodist Church has built and continues to run in so many of our metropolitan centers across this nation. Even my father, the last eight weeks of his life was spent at the Nebraska Methodist Hospital up in Omaha. All of these institutions are well and fine as success stories for Methodists. But if the day ever comes that Duke University of North Carolina or Emory University of Atlanta or Southern Methodist University down in Dallas become the chief reasons that we are Methodist, then we have exchanged the love of our Lord for the institution itself. And that would be a sad day indeed. But some will always love the culture of the church more than the Lord of the church. Friends, the trappings of religion are so tempting. Jesus can help you clear away the fog. He can help you keep big what is big and keep small what really is small. He can show you the way and the truth and the life. Religious trappings can't do that. Betty Hutton was a famous movie star and a huge box office attraction back in the 1940s and the 1950s. But somewhere along the line, Betty Hutton got lost. Hard times came, family problems, emotional illness, bankruptcy, bankruptcy, depression, alcoholism, All of these things came crashing down upon Betty Hutton. 
But a few years ago, really not that long ago, she welcomed God into her life. This was at the latter stages of her life. And she even made a comeback. She came back into the theatrical world. She joined the cast of the musical production on Broadway, Annie, playing the role of Mrs. Hennigan. At the first performance, the program bulletin contained extensive biographical sketches about the members of the cast, except for Betty Hutton. Under her picture, there appeared only five words, and she had written them about herself. They said, I'm back, thanks to God. Kind of said it all, didn't it? Said it all. You see, it was late in life, but she found the way and the truth and the life. No one knows how to give that to you better than Jesus Christ. We can have many secondary missions, and I listed a whole bunch of those last week. But our primary mission is to promote the saviorship of Jesus Christ so that he can bring healing and wholeness to those around us and to ourselves. That's why we are a church. Amen. Thank you for joining us on our pre-recorded Sunday morning service. If you would like a copy, you can contact the office at 660-359-6762 or email us at wesleyum at sbcglobal.net. Feel free to visit us in person or online at wesleyunitedmethodist.us where you will always find open hearts, open minds, and open doors. May the blessings of Jesus Christ be upon you in every aspect of your life.